Welcome back to the second technical session of today's national seminar on mergers and acquisitions. We have with us two eminent speakers to take us through the structuring and due diligence, cross border transactions, and Indian tax considerations. Now, I request C. Rashmi to escort our speakers. See Ajay Mo, Associate Director, M&D Tax and Regulatory Services, PwC, and see N.G. Ramachandran, Executive Director, KPMG, on to the dais and welcome them with floral bouquet. These would need to be followed 
while undertaking an MA exercise. We look at a few case studies and then we talk about new diligence. As one can see on the slide, there are several ways by which one can acquire companies. But the most crucial aspect is what is the objective with which you start looking at an acquisition? What are the commercial objectives that a company has when it begins to look or scout for companies? That is the most important question that we as advisors need to understand before we get into the modes of m &E. As an example, some companies would like to acquire only businesses, which means to say that they would not want the legal entity per se. For that, you will possibly look at business purchase, which you can see on the left hand side of your slide. If a company is keen on acquiring not only the business but also the brand or the IP, you'll possibly look at a stock acquisition, which again comes under acquisitions, which is listed on the slide. Additionally, depending on what is the objective, you can have a slum sale under a business purchase or an itemized sale. This is typically a concept that is created under the Indian Income Tax Act. Worldwide, this slum sale or itemized sale is simply known as an asset acquisition vis-a-vis -a, -vis a share acquisition. In a share acquisition, you can have a buyout from existing shareholders or you can have a preferential issue by target company. If I were to step back, Typically as an advisor or typically when you are looking at doing an acquisition, your first thought may be where should I put in the money? Should the money go into the business or should it go to the promoters? Because that's a very important question that needs to be addressed. As long as the money is going into the company, a buyer is fairly okay in terms of the comfort he has because once the money goes into the company, the buyer has some level of control in terms of how the money will be spent. If the buyer is not putting in the money into the company, a buyer will normally be hesitant or he will be a little more risk averse, if I may put it. So therefore, what is important is to understand what essentially the buyer wants and what essentially the seller wants. If the seller's objective is to exit the business completely, then he would be looking at extracting the cash completely and taking away the cash. In such a situation, you will only have a buyout from existing shareholders. You will not look at a preferential issue. Alternatively, if there is a part or a partial exit from the company, a buyer will, and a seller for that matter, will look at a partial exit which means to say that the seller will want some sort or some compensation in the form of cash which he can take away and the rest of it invested in the company. So therefore, simply put, the way you do an acquisition really depends on what the buyer and seller wants. And as consultants or as advisors, our only objective here is to make sure the commercials are met on both sides. Moving on to mergers and demergers. This is typically a mode of MMA that is followed for intra-group restructuring. Because even if you adopt a merger or a demerger between two unrelated parties, somewhere the link has to be cut. Because in a merger, what will happen is the amalgamated company will issue shares to the shareholders of the amalgamating company which essentially means that there will be existing shareholders in the amalgamating company which will continue to hold shares in the amalgamated company. So if you are looking at a complete exit, your amalgamations and demergers will not work fully. What will have to happen is an amalgamation or a demerger can happen 
where your existing shareholders become shareholders in the amalgamated or the resulting company and then there is a share sale or an asset sale. So, depending on what the objectives are, in summary, you will look at one of the modes of acquisitions that we've just spoken of. Let's now just talk about what are the key frameworks or the regulations that are laid down under the Indian Companies Act, both the old act and the new act, relating to cross-border mergers. And here I'll just focus purely on cross-border mergers and acquisitions. And when I focus on cross-border mergers and acquisitions, one key aspect which all of us know here is that there has been a paradigm shift in the way mergers and acquisitions are going to take place under the new act. As we all are aware, there are several key amendments to the Companies Act relating to mergers and acquisitions. But like I said, the most important amendment relating to cross-border mergers and acquisitions is that under the old act, you can only have a foreign company merging inward into an Indian company. Whereas under the new law, which is not yet effective, you will possibly have an Indian company merging outside India with a foreign company. So this is the most significant aspect or they call it the game changer if I would uh, uh, put it differently in terms of the amendment under the Companies Act on cross-border mergers. That said, there are several questions which are unanswered. So if one looks at an outward or an outbound cross-border merger, which means an Indian company merging with a foreign company, there are some very ticklish issues which are not yet addressed. The company law provides for an outward merger of an Indian company, but corresponding adjustments have not been made either under the Income Tax Act or under the FEMA regulations. So therefore, if one looks at whether cross-border mergers would still continue in a smooth or an efficient manner, today the answer is no. There are several amendments which have to take place. As an example, a cross-border merger of an Indian company into an overseas company is not tax neutral. Because if you look at the definition under the Income Tax Act, section 47, the amalgamated company has to be an Indian company. And in a cross-border merger, where the amalgamated company is a company outside of India, it will not fit into the exemption under section 47. And therefore, tax benefits are today not available. Moving on to another small aspect which I thought I'll just share with you under the Companies Act. The words used in a cross-border merger or in the section relating to cross-border merger is companies registered under this act can merge with a foreign company. So does it mean to say that companies registered under the 2013 act alone can outward merge or companies registered under the 1956 act also can merge. So that's a little bit of an interpretation issue and being chartered accountants we do not leave any opportunity to point out a lack of name or lack of clarity. My personal view here is that the intent of the law is to allow all companies to merge with a foreign company or whether India or whether Indian or foreign. So given the intent of the law, I would expect a clarification when the section gets notified that any Indian company, whether incorporated under the 1956 Act or under the 2013 Act, will be permitted to merge outside. Another question. The section under the Companies Act says that in a cross-border merger, the discharge of consideration has to be by way of cash or ideas or Indian depository receipts. Can shares be issued is a question. Or rather, to put it another way, shares cannot be issued in a cross-border merger as we speak today. Therefore, if you are looking at a seamless integration, you will not only have shares, 
but you will have ideas which will be issued in consideration of a cross-border merger. Shares of an Indian company or other shares of a foreign company may not be permitted to be issued in a cross-border merger. This is one aspect which needs clarity from the regulators today. Having spoken of cross-border merger, let's look at cross-border demerger. Today as we speak, cross-border demergers are not permissible because the law doesn't provide for it. The section talks of amalgamations, mergers. It doesn't talk of demergers. And therefore, a view that is emerging is that unless clarity is obtained under the new laws, whether corporate law, income tax act or the exchange control regulations, we may not be able to see a lot of cross-border merger activity happening in the country today. I put down some examples to illustrate what we have been talking for the last few minutes. Let's look at example 1. This example had a foreign company merging into an Indian company. A foreign company <coughs> merging into an Indian company was permitted under the 1956 Act. So just for your benefit, I don't know if you can make out the color combination. The 1956, the letters 1956 and 2013 are in green, indicating that it is possible. If you look at the second example, which is an Indian company merging into a foreign company, that was not allowed under the 1956 Act, but is now proposed to be allowed under the 2013 Act. If you look at the third example, which talks of one of the divisions of a foreign company moving into an Indian company. This is a demerger, if I may call it. Under the 1956 Act, it was allowed. A division of a foreign company moving into an Indian company was permitted under the 1956 Act and it is permitted under the 2013 Act. If you look at outbound demergers, which means a division from the Indian company moving to a foreign company, today it is unfortunately not permitted both under the 1956 Act and the 2013 Act. With this little bit of examples, let's just move on to talk about some of the challenges that have been talking on the exchange control front. I don't want to spend a lot of time on these slides because these are really valuation related slides which I'm sure all of us are aware of. But just to give you a quick recap, if you look at a cross-border merger, there are few key aspects that one would need to look at. The first is whether the foreign direct investment policy permits it or not. So in any cross-border merger, one would need to look at whether the FDI policy permits investments by a foreign company into that sector where the company is operating. If the sector that we are talking of, let's say you're looking at the real estate sector, and if you're looking at a cross-border merger in the real estate sector, there are restrictions under the FDI policy. So though the Companies Act 2013 may permit a cross-border merger, you may still not be able to merge simply given the fact that it's not permitted under the FDI policy. So therefore, it is important to look at what the FDI policy says with regard to specific sectors and specific sectoral caps in terms of percentages for what investments are permitted under the automatic rule. If you are looking at transfer of shares of an Indian company, we all know what are the valuation guidelines. BCF is the normal method that is laid for unlisted companies and for listed companies you have SEBI guidelines. I will not spend too much time on that. If you are looking at outbound investment, which means investments by an Indian company outside of India, you are possibly looking at ODI guidelines or overseas direct investment guidelines. So under the ODI guidelines today as we speak, any outbound investment up to 100% of the net worth of the Indian entity investing outside India is permitted under the automatic rule, subject to some restricted sectors. And therefore, when one looks at a cross-border merger or a demerger, one would really need to see whether the sectoral caps apply, the valuation guidelines are taken care of, and whether the ODI policy would permit it. Keeping these three aspects in mind, one can fairly 
arrive at a yes or a no answer in terms of whether you can do a cross border merger or no purely from an exchange control perspective there are some very interesting aspects that are thrown up if you look at cross border merger let me talk about some of these examples the first example here is if you are looking at an overseas company merging into an indian company the overseas company assuming it has operations the overseas company then folds up into the indian entity and when it folds up into the indian entity the question is what happens to the overseas operations are they wound up the obvious answer is no operations would continue so then what would happen the resultant structure would simply be that the indian company has a branch outside india if you look at the other way round foreign company merging or other sorry the indian company merging into a foreign company the indian company assuming it has operations will fold up into the foreign company so therefore the foreign company will then have operations in india do those operations constitute a branch office and whether rbi approvals or rbi applications need to be made in this cross border or in this type of a cross border merger the obvious answer is yes simply because the companies that allows you to do a cross border merger doesn't mean that you can take a position which is contrary to the fema regulations so therefore you will have to apply and to obtain a branch registration similar concepts or similar facts uh, would apply to acquisition of an immovable property because companies or rather non residents and indian companies there are restrictions on holding of immovable property so those aspects also have to be considered you will have similar issues on ecds or dbcs or external commercial borrowings because as we all know an indian company can only borrow money in the form of ecds from specified lenders and specified lenders would mean equity holders holding more than 25% and possibly your non equity holders mean international financial institutions so if they have borrowed from or let's say if a foreign company has borrowed money from a local bank outside of india from a bank outside of india and that entity is merging into the indian entity you possibly have the indian entity borrowing from a local bank outside which may not be technically permitted today or which is not permitted today so these throw up a lot of questions and challenges in terms of how do we actually implement a cross border merger in terms of an outbound cross border merger which is now permitted under the indian companies act 2013 and therefore i think the only question is whether the income tax act would be amended to provide for exemptions for these cross border mergers and whether the fema regulations will be relaxed to provide for these cross border mergers in a smooth and efficient manner i just put down a couple of slides on some illustrations on what we already discussed so here we have a foreign company merging into an indian company just to quickly go through we will have to take the approval from the high court we will have to take an rbi or an fibb approval depending on the sectoral caps and the sectors that the company is operating in the cross border merger will be tax neutral if conditions are satisfied and we will have to take approvals from overseas jurisdictions if you look at a foreign company here which is a subsidiary of the indian company we are looking at the indian subsidiary which is a foreign company merging into the indian company similar issues apply i would not like to spend too much time on this this is a typical case where we have an indian branch and there is a demerger of the indian branch into the indian company so there have been a couple of instances where this kind of a process or this kind of an uh, this kind of a restructuring has been carried out by kn india in this particular case where they demerge the assets of the indian branch into an indian company today as we speak uh, there is a requirement to obtain rbi approval for any asset transfer by an indian branch only in terms of a branch closure uh there has been a recent circular issued on may 30th which allows for 
demerger without RBI approval or transfer of assets without RBI approval only in the event of a branch closure. That said, one interesting aspect which is thrown about when I talk about these cross-border mergers is we are all looking at the Indian aspects of cross-border mergers. Just as I spoke of the Indian aspects of cross-border mergers, one would really need to see whether the foreign company which we are talking of and the local laws of the foreign country where the foreign entity is established, whether that country permits cross-border mergers or not. As an example, I do know that the Singapore law does not permit a cross-border merger of a foreign company into Singapore. So while the Indian law may permit it, the maximum questions that we have received or at least I have received is can I merge a foreign company into a Singapore company or can I merge an Indian company into a Singapore company for whatever benefits we all know. The answer today is under the domestic law of Singapore, there is no cross-border merger or no cross-border mergers are permitted. So before we kind of arrive at a conclusion in terms of whether a cross-border merger is permitted or no, we will also have to look at the pros and cons and the permissibility of the arrangement from the other side. Having said that, let me spend a few minutes on due diligences. And before I start to talk about due diligences, I'd just like to share one experience of mine. Normally, you know, many people would have heard that it is only the army men and the police officials or the policemen who risk their lives, right, in the line of duty. I would say chartered accountants also risk their lives in the line of duty. I was put in a due diligence room, which is essentially a due diligence. So, so before I kind of uh, talk a little more about this experience, basically a due diligence is an exercise carried out to determine how well a company is doing. So typically when you do this due diligence, we, are, we chartered accountants are expected to visit the company on whom the due diligence is being made. And in one such due diligence, we were told that we had to complete the work in one day. Maximum two people, you will only be given a 4x4 four four room. We were all set, we had packed our bags and we landed up, at least I landed up with another person in Bombay. We were put into the room and we were told not to walk about because nobody else knows that this due diligence is being done. So we cannot walk about. We were locked inside a room for two hours without water. I got a call saying, or did I made frantic call saying, look, I need water, so can you please supply water? Then I also asked for coffee, thinking that, okay, fine, I, I will not get another opportunity to call. So I asked for coffee. I was served cold coffee first. Second, I was served coffee without sugar. Touch wood, I'm not a diabetic, but the coffee was cold without sugar. And I was called for lunch, so this was at 9.30 in the morning. I was called for lunch at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. So just imagine my plight in terms of sitting in a 4x4 four four room with a complete box of files doing a due diligence. So I would definitely say that we chartered accountants also risk our lives in the call of duty. That said, what really, we, uh, what really do we do in a due diligence? In a due diligence, or there are different kinds of due diligence. The due diligence exercise will first allow us to answer some basic questions like what are we buying? We need to know what a buyer is buying. But I would also want to know whether the price that he is paying is appropriate or no. Additionally, through the due diligence process, the buyer would also know whether to do a slum sale or an asset acquisition or to do a share sale. If there are non-compliances under the Companies Act, under the FEMA, FERA regulations, violations, we would normally suggest that a due diligence be undertaken and a stock acquisition, I'm sorry, an asset acquisition be undertaken, meaning to say you leave behind the company. So due diligence exercise typically is carried out to understand what we are buying, whether we are buying it at the right price, and how we buy it. These are the three simple questions that will be answered in any due diligence. 
There are different types of due diligence and each due diligence will address or answer some key questions that are listed on the slide. The first question is whether there are any tax exposures that one would need to be careful of. The second is the seller will say that my business is doing really well, it's been growing 20%, 25% year on year. So a due diligence exercise in this specific case of financial due diligence exercise will help us know whether the buyer or rather what the seller is saying is correct or not. So that's validating the representations made by the seller. In terms of valuation, a due diligence or other, just to step back, a valuation is made or is arrived at depending on certain basic assumptions that a valuer will do. A due diligence exercise seeks to identify whether each of those assumptions are correct or not. Therefore, valuation aspects also get addressed in a due diligence. And finally, like I have been saying, a due diligence will tell us whether to do an asset acquisition or a share acquisition. Many times, or most of the common due diligences are buyer due diligences, which means a due diligence undertaken by the buyer. There are many aspects or there are many cases where the seller himself voluntarily undertakes a due diligence and thereby that kind of a due diligence is known as a vendor due diligence. So the distinguishing factor, when does a, when does a buyer go for a buyer due diligence and when does a seller go for the seller due diligence? A buyer in most of the cases will go for a due diligence unless of course he has been told that you can't do a due diligence, you take it or leave it. It's like buying a company on an as is various basis. In such a situation, normally due diligence will not be permitted. But in 99% of the cases, due diligences do happen from the buyer's side. From the seller's side, what happens is the seller many times would not want to expose all the records directly in a buyer due diligence. So the seller himself will carry out a due diligence which will kind of identify various aspects, validate various assumptions that the seller has made and it will be issued by an independent valuer or an independent consulting firm. So this vendor due diligence, once it's issued by an independent consulting firm, this due diligence will act as a bouncing board for the seller to push back the buyer on various demands made by the buyer. So before buying a company, the buyer will make a lot of demands in terms of you know, I want access for 5 years records, I want to see every single entry, I want explanations, etc, etc, etc. If you have a vendor due diligence, the seller will simply shut them out of the buyer to a large extent. And you will tell the buyer to only ask questions which are not asked in the vendor due diligence report. And this is what we see in terms of due diligences. Each due diligence is very unique. Each due diligence is very challenging. And many people I know have risked their lives like I just mentioned. And the most satisfying thing in a due diligence is to finally see or ensure that you take the due diligence report forward, resolve the issues and conclude the deal. Several deals just fall through by the wayside because of errors in the company, whether in terms of compliance, whether in terms of uh, the upkeep of records, whether there are tax exposures, etc, etc. But the most satisfying thing for a consultant is to finally see his due diligence report being taken, errors rectified, deal done and both parties happy. On this note, I will open the forum for any questions and uh, happy to address uh, any specific questions. Taxable event, but nothing to do with the FDI. 
and Indian assets will become foreign assets in a merger situation. So you still feel FDI is the issue or FEMA is the issue? Because there is no foreign direct investment really in a cross border. Yeah, can so you clarify that one please? Sure. So in an outbound merger, FDI does not come into play. It is only the FEMA issue. In terms of a foreign company owning the Indian assets, and possibly to just spend half a minute on that, the question is related to uh, an Indian company merging into a foreign company. So when an Indian company merges into a foreign company, the foreign company becomes the owner of the Indian assets. So here technically there is no ODI uh, or there is no FDI per se in terms of foreign direct investment into India. It's more about FEMA issues pertaining to A, if the Indian entity had operations, that really becomes a branch of the foreign company. So therefore, various aspects or permissions relating to or applicable to an Indian branch of a foreign company would need to be taken care of. So technically, it's just simply the regulations pertaining to a branch office who need to be taken care of. Hope that addresses. Uh, with this, uh, I'd like to once again thank uh, everyone here for giving me this opportunity uh, to speak at this office gathering and uh, I take it very humbly uh, as my honor. Thank you. Good afternoon everyone. My spoke, uh, first speaker had a very excellent topic which is in fact new, so it was more exciting. But the topic which I may be speaking is something which everybody has heard already, maybe routine, but we will see some of the new developments which has come in the recent times. Today we are looking at uh, income tax issues on demergers, lump sale, and itemized sale. If we look at these three transactions, there is one common feature which everyone can realize, which is transfer of a business asset from one company to another. So there is a change in the ownership of the business asset. That's the common feature in all the three. Maybe the Modality is little different. For example, in the case of a demerger and slum sale, again there is a commonality. It is a sale of a, or a transfer of an undertaking. Whereas when it comes to the itemized sale, it's a transfer of individual assets. So there is a difference when it comes to the itemized sale as compared to the other. Now, there is a similarity between slum sale and itemized sale and demerger stands apart. How is that? So generally the slum sale and itemized sale will be triggered by an acquisition as we saw a little while before. So it's when a due diligence is made based on the risk appetite of the buyer, he may like to buy a business or if he feels that business is also riskier, he may opt for a purchase of assets, itemized assets and possibly some of the liabilities. Whereas in a demerger, it is more likely to be triggered by the seller for various reasons. For example, a focus on particular business which is more profitable and possibly the management thinks that it can be hived off and without exposing the irregularities or the issues which are there in the other businesses in the company. So you will have off, demerge your particular business into a separate entity. So when a due diligence happens, you don't expose the entire businesses. 
you only expose the particular business which you want to hang off. So on that front, there is a little difference when it comes to the demerge or another. So having looked at this kind of a conceptual uh, understanding, let's look at the income tax provisions governing these three transactions. Taking first the demerger, section 2, subsection 19AA defines what are the conditions to be satisfied in order to constitute a tax neutral demerger. Simply said, as we understand, demerger is a transfer by a company of its one or more undertaking to the resulting company. Of course. The resulting company has to be an Indian company as well. Now, there are certain conditions which are required to be satisfied in order to be a tax neutral demerger. All the properties and the liabilities of the undertaking has to be transferred of the undertaking at their book values. And when the demerger happens, the consideration has to flow by way of shares. This is a requirement under the income tax law. Though commercially you can have a shares plus other mode of consideration <coughs> as well. But if you have to satisfy uh, the condition as per the income tax law, then it has to be only by way of shares. And the allotment of shares to shareholders holding not less than three fourths in the value of the shares of the demerged company. Now, in a scenario of a holding company, uh, there could be the shares held by the same entity as well. So there may not be multiple shareholders. So there has been a specific uh, exception to this where the shares are already held by them, then you can ignore that and the rest only will be looked upon. Otherwise, you will never satisfy this condition. And the transfer of the undertaking has to be on a going concern basis. We will look a little later as to what this going concern basis means. Simply put, what is an undertaking? Undertaking shall include any part of the undertaking or a unit or a division of an undertaking or a business activity as a whole. But what it does not include is individual assets or liabilities, a combination thereof, which is distinguished from a business activity. Now, then, uh, what is a business activity? Now we have to come to the fundamentals. So, how do you identify an undertaking? Now, in amalgamation, the requirement is an industrial undertaking. Whereas that sort of condition is not there in a demerger. In the demerger, the industrial world is absent. So, therefore, even if you have a systematic business activity, which does not manufacture anything, you can still do a demerger. For example, in the NPFC activity, investment into shares of the company, it can be had, it can be done as a demerger to a different entity. That's possible. Whereas possibly in amalgamation, you may not be able to achieve this kind of a result. So that is a crucial uh, uh, distinction between amalgamation and demerger. Now, in this, the one place which may be there is, suppose a company has only one investment in one company, whether it will satisfy as an undertaking. Just only one investment in one company. So, there are contrary views on this. Even a Supreme Court decision is available on this, where they have taken note of other circumstances to hold that it will be considered as a business activity. So, the other circumstances are, for example, where the investment has been done, and over and above that, the services have been provided to the subsidiary companies. So, there they said that, yes, it will be considered as an undertaking. However, we have seen in some of the later decisions, 
by some high courts and tribunal, a contrary view has been taken. Where a similar holding company having investment in a subsidiary company where it has been uh, providing various management services, they have taken a contrary view. So one has to look into circumstances when it specifically comes to the single investment. Now, let's look at the tax implication in the hands of the shareholders of the Dimash company. As a shareholder of the Dimash company, what happens is when the demerger happens, the value in the shares gets reduced, which is a fair value, not the face value. To that extent, they receive the shares of the resulting company to compensate them. So that's the scheme which will be presented and we will get the approval in the high court. Now, when you receive the shares, the shareholder does not give any consideration for the receipt of the shares. So, one may think as to whether there is a trigger of taxation on receipt of the resulting company shares. Section 47 says that issue of shares by a resulting company will not be regarded as a transfer. Because of its specific exclusion and because it does not constitute a transfer, the shareholder is exempt in terms of the receipt of the resulting company shares. Now the shareholder who has received the shares of the resulting company can at a later stage sell those shares. So how do you compute the cost? Because he did pay anything. In that circumstances, you go by the section 49 subsection 2c which provides a formula as to how to compute the resulting company's cost of the shares. You take the cost of the shares in the demerge company and the proportionate value of the net book value of the assets transferred to the resulting company to the net worth of the demerge company. Now this information has to be there at all point of time in case you decide to do a demerge. Suppose you do a deal merger today and after 5 years you try to sell the shares and you don't have because the resulting company has been sold out, then you will land into problem because you will be dependent upon an external party for this kind of information. So it is advisable that when you are doing a planning a deal merger, you have all the particulars with you. And as a result, the cost of the shares in the demerged company is also proportionately reduced. So we have worked out the cost of the shares in the resulting company. Now, will that get added to the cost of the demerged shares which you have been holding because the face value has not reduced? But section clearly provides that you will have to reduce the cost of your uh, shares in the demerged company as well by reducing the amount which you have taken for the cost of the resulting company shares. When it comes to the period of holding the shares for the purpose of indexation, benefit, etc., you can take the period of holding of the shares in the demerge company. And the Section 222 very categorically says that there is no deep dividend implication on receipt of the resulting company shares as well. Let's look at the taxation in the hands of the demerge company. The demerged company is going to transfer the assets to the resulting company. That transfer is not considered as a transfer as per section 47 6b clause 6b. Therefore, there is no capital gain arising on account of transfer of capital assets by a demerged company to the resulting company. And similarly, when there is a foreign reorganization, in the case of the Indian company held by a foreign company and the foreign company is demerging one of the businesses which helps the Indian company shares to a resultant foreign company, then again there will be a capital gain exemption provided the shareholders holding at least 75% of the shares in the demerged company continue to be the shareholder in the resulting company 
and there is no capital gain tax on the transaction in that jurisdiction. So if that jurisdiction does not tax, then in India also you are not required to pay any tax on this bond. Now the assets have been transferred. Maybe the demerger has taken in the middle of the year, not on April 1st. So what happens to the WD? Well, how do you compute the depreciation? In case of depreciation, section 32 of the proviso says that you will do a proportionate computation in terms of the number of days used by the demerged company and the resulting company. And accordingly, both companies will claim the respective shares. And the WDB, section 43.6, clearly says that it has to be reduced by the WDB of the assets which has been transferred to the resulting company. So in the hands of the demerged company, what will be left will be the WDB of the assets which are still with them. And as far as the expenditure which has been incurred in the demerger, you can claim one-fifth of it for five years as per section 35 BD. Let's look at the taxation in the hands of the resulting company. Right now we saw the WDB has to be as per the transferred asset, so that and the depreciation we have already looked at. On the specific issue of transfer or issue of sales by the resulting company, Again, it is not regarded as a transfer and therefore there is no incidence of capital gain in the case of issue of shares by the resulting company to the shareholders. And suppose the business or undertaking which has been transferred in the demerger has some unabsorbed business loss and unabsorbed depreciation, then you are permitted to claim only to the balance period. For example, if it has been there for four years, then unabsorbed business losses can be claimed for another four years. Whereas unabsorbed depreciation, there is no restriction, so you continue to claim forever. And this is a distinction as compared to amalgamation, where in case of amalgamation, the business losses may get a full fresh lease, uh, full life in terms of the eight years period. So that is not possible in the case of a demerger. Now we take a case of a slum sale. As we saw, this is a factor which is triggered by an acquirer. Of course, my co speaker explained that what are the scenarios where a slum sale or itemized sale can be taken up by a buyer. So in slum sale, the issue is not only from a buyer side but also from a slum, uh, from a seller side. In some cases, the seller may not be willing to go by the slum sale for various reasons, or the buyer may not resort to again, like for example, there are stamp duty, VAT implication, which needs to be looked at as well in these cases. So those also are the drivers apart from the income tax implication. Slum sale, as simply we understand, it's a transfer of one or more undertaking for a lump sum consideration without values being assigned for the individual assets and liabilities. So, if there is an individual assets and liabilities, we go to the itemized sale. It no more constitutes a slum sale. And the term undertaking has been defined as same as what has been in the section governing the demerger. And it could be part of the undertaking, it could be a full unit or a division or again a business activity as we have seen in the demerger. So there is a similarity here as we have spoken earlier between the demerger and the slum sale. Now when it comes to the slum sale, typically the agreement is drafted in many cases in order to pay the stamp duty, where the agreement also may capture the value of the land and so section 242c explanation 2 very categorically says that if the value has been assigned only for the duty purpose, that does not take the character out of the transaction to be a slum sale. So because it has been valued separately, it doesn't become an itemized sale. First, 
let's look at the taxation in the hands of the seller where he sells sells a uh, undertaking as a business. In the case of the cost of acquisition, the tax net worth of the undertaking has to be determined in terms of the depreciable assets by the income tax WDV of the assets and for other assets whatever is the book value. So the aggregate of these two will constitute your net worth of the company and that net worth constitutes the cost of acquisition which you will reduce from the consideration to arrive at the capital gain. And like any other business asset, the undertaking is also considered as a capital asset. And if you are holding it for more than three years, it is possible to claim the uh, long term capital gain and also some of the exemptions, which we will see a little later. Now, when the sun sale happens, how do you calculate the depreciation? The depreciation has to be calculated by reducing the tax WDP of the assets which has been transferred in a slum sale. So this is in the hands of a seller. Now there is no specific guideline on proportionate to the number of days as we have seen in the demerging case. So that may throw some practical uh, issues when the transaction happens in the middle of the year. And in terms of the requirement, Along with the return, you are also required to file a chartered accountant's report in Form 3 CEA for the valuation of the net worth. And this has been made online now, so this is a requirement which you will have to keep note of. And it is possible to claim an exemption if the capital gain is a long term capital gain under Section 54 EC, up to 50 lakhs if you can invest in those bonds. And in case you are individual, if the seller is an individual selling a business, then it is possible that he can claim a long term uh, capital gain exemption under section 54F by investing in the house property. This is all fine as long as the net worth is positive. What happens if the net worth is negative? Liability is more than the asset. So, an interesting argument came up before Mumbai Special Bench in the case of Samin Securities. The argument was that the moment the net worth is negative, the computation mechanism should fail. But the tribunal did not accept this and they said, no, if it is negative, please add that to your consideration. Because what you have got has been reduced by the amount. So that both you will have to increase the consideration by the amount and you will still be liable for the capital gain. But unlike other capital asset, there is no indexation possible in this case and the revaluation of assets if there is anything which has been done in the past has to be ignored in case of the book values. When it comes to the hands of the buyer, he typically may be a third party. If he is a third party, he only buys a business and he has paid one lump sum consideration. Then the question of allocation of that consideration among the assets arises. How do you value? How do you record in the books? How do you then depreciate? So the most practical and the common approach which has been adopted is that you have an independent valuer value the assets backed by that report, allocate the purchase consideration to various assets and liabilities. Now the most interesting aspect in these kind of transactions of slum sale is where the payment is made on account of reputation or some of the intangible. Typically the asset value which you are recording in the books will be very less and there will be a balancing figure which is captured as a good way. And this could be one of the very important aspect when you are considering between a slum sale and an itemized asset. If this goodwill can be depreciated, then it is the best form of acquisition. Of course, one has to look at as to how and what are the factors which result in the goodwill, but of late we 
can see that the valuation in terms of the slum sale results in some of the tangible, intangible uh, equations and there is an intangible asset created and the goodwill is related to the intangible asset and depreciation is claimed against it. We have some favorable case laws as well in order to claim the depreciation on such goodwill. Now, earlier we looked at uh, what is a going concern. So, in a case of a uh, undertaking being transferred, the condition is that it has to be transferred as a going, a going concern. The definition of undertaking generally is wide enough to include a business activity. Now, in this case, if the business is not doing well and has been ceased, how will you regard that? That is one of the issues. Second, what constitutes the undertaking? So, individual assets also be captured as part of the agreement. There is a value also assigned to the assets. However, that value may not total to the consideration. So, can you say that because there is an individual value assigned to various assets which has been subject matter of transfer of undertaking, it loses the identity as undertaking. So, this also has been a subject matter of uh, litigation and there has been cases also that some of the assets have been omitted while the transfer happens. Say for example, in a case, vehicles have been omitted while the business is transferred. In one case, landed building has been omitted. But the other assets forming part of the business along with the liability has been transferred. So, these are the normal litigation which we see in these cases as to what constitutes a undertaking and what is a going concern. The courts and the tribunals have very clearly said as long as you constitute, as long as the business can be conducted without any hindrance. Merely because one or two assets have been left out, that should not make it a item as C. It still constitutes a slum sale. That's number one. And when it comes to the going concern, there may be a temporary cessation of activity by a company. But if they are able to sell that in a condition where the purchaser is able to operate it right from the day one or maybe immediately after doing some little bit of uh, repair and uh, all those things, then it will satisfy the condition of the going concern. So, we have cases which support these two views and we can take into consideration these things when we structure the transaction. I think uh, this we can omit because there is a lot of more preliminary. Now, there are differences as we have seen from a slum sale which is governed under section 50B and 50C which is relevant for an itemized sale. So, one has to be very clear in terms of though the value is captured in the agreement for a London building, it does not fall under 50C. It may still fall under 50B as long as it satisfies the condition of transfer of the business. And similarly, merely because the transfer of business consists of assets which are only depreciable assets, does not, that does not take away the character of the slum sale and put it into the basket into and you compute the um, result and capital gains under section 50, which is applicable for the disposal of a sale of asset, depreciable asset. One important thing which we need to keep in mind in case of slum sale and the item I say when you are transferring out is a provision of section 281. So, in case there are any proceedings under the Act, then the aforesaid transfer can be considered as void. If there is a demand, the income tax officer can press the demand. And therefore, it is important that there are sufficient indemnities involved in the agreement of sale. Item I say, it's very simple. I don't think we need to spend time. 
The only thing which is uh, in terms of the depreciable assets, we know that section 50 governs it and non-depreciable assets, we have section 48 which gives the indexation benefit as well and for all other business assets, it will be considered under the income PGBP. So it's fairly simple. Very quickly, some case studies. Now, company A has two units. Unit B has been demerged to company B. The liability is taken over is more than the value of the assets and therefore no consideration in terms of the shares given to the shareholders. Is it a tax neutral merger? Or is it a slum sale? Any thoughts? So in this case, there is no demerger as per the income tax act because there is no issue of shares. Again, there is no slum sale because this is arrangement under the scheme of demerger before a high court. And this is a case which has been decided by the Mumbai Tribunal. Let's look at the next case study. Again, Unit B has been sold by way of a slum sale. In this case, the Unit B is also an export-oriented unit. Ten B is not there, but still, for just the example's sake, if it had been claiming exemption and reduction under Section Ten B as a hundred percent EOU, can the unit after the slum sale claim the benefit, or can the company B? can be considered to have come into existence by way of a splitting up or reconstruction, which is the important section in uh, section 10b to claim the direction. Because it's an existing unit. Any thoughts? Right, absolutely right. So, in this case, the company B can claim for the balance period of the uh, uh, 10, uh, 10 B deduction, and it is not considered as fitting up because it is transferred as a going concern. So the undertaking itself has moved. So ownership does not matter. The undertaking, as long as it satisfies the uh, condition prescribed under Section 10 B, can continue to claim for the balance period. Next one. Here it's a transfer of unit B to company B and the transfer took place in exchange of preference shares and bonds. No consideration in terms of the cash. So whether the transfer of undertaking in exchange of preference shares and bonds can be considered as a slum sale. I think this is a very, very recent uh, high court decision. Yeah, please. Exactly. So when it comes to the slum sale under section 50B, what is required is the monetary consideration. That is because it says sale by way of a sale. If you look at that uh, definition of a transfer, transfer includes extinguishment of rights and all those things, which is not there in the case of section uh, 50B. And therefore, in this case, in the absence of a monetary consideration, they are considered as a uh, non taxable transfer. The last case study the unit B is demerged to company B. I think we have looked at this. The company A has stopped its operation and had applied for the revival. Now, as long as the unit B is able to continue their operations after the demerger, the demerger is considered to satisfy the conditions of the section and uh, as to it is transferred as a going concern. So it will be eligible as a tax neutral demerger. I think we have first of time, so uh, let's take the questions later offline during the lunch. On behalf of Bangladesh of uh, SARC of ICI, 
We like to express our sincere uh, thanks to Mr. Ajay Emma for giving an excellent coverage on structure and due diligence, cross-border transactions, types of due diligence. Thank you very much, sir. We must mention our deep, deep sense of appreciation for CE M.G. Ramchandran for his explanation of Indian tax considerations, slum scene versus itemized scene versus demature. Please give them a good round of applause to our eminent speakers for sharing their words and enriching us with their knowledge. Now I request CE Ashwin Dagliya to come forward and present a moment to To our eminent speakers, C. Ajay Amar, and C. M. G. Ramchandra. Thank you very much. Now. I hand over the session uh, to our seminar coordinator, C.H. Ramayat.